Good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to continue on our journey with Answer to Job with paragraph 725. We're working on uh, the biblical ver book of the apocalypse, uh, which is Revelation. And uh, one of my partners here, Jordan Hoggard, is joining us. So uh, good morning, Jordan. Thank you for joining us. Nice to see you today. Um, good morning, Skip. Yep. Okay, well, I was just going to begin. And so... There was video. I'll, I'm going to get my coffee. Okay, no worries. I am here. Okay, I am going to read... Uh, chapter or paragraph 725. 725, okay. It is Christ who, leading the host of angels, treads the winepress of the fierce and wrath, fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. His robe is dipped in blood. He rides a white horse, and with the sword which issues out of his mouth, he kills the beast and the false prophet. Presumably, presumably his or John's dark counterpart. That is, the shadow Satan is locked up in the bottomless pit for a thousand years, and Christ shall reign for the same length of time. After that, he must be loosed. Uh, after, that, after that, he must, must be loosed a little season. This thousand years correspond astrologically to the first half of the Pisces Ion, the setting, the setting free of Satan after this time must therefore correspond, one cannot imagine any other reason for it, to the enantiodromia of the Christian Aeon, that is, to the reign of the Antichrist, whose coming would be, whose coming could be predicted in, on astrological grounds. Finally, at the end of an unspecified period, the devil is thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone forever and ever, but not completely destroyed as in Enoch, and the whole of the first creation disappears. Okay. So one interesting thing here is a footnote at the bottom of our on the bottom of page 84, third line in on paragraph 725, which is um, as follows. Here again, astrological speculations concerning the second half of the Christian eon may be implied, with Pegasus as perinatalon of Aquarius. Now, I didn't know what perinatalon meant either. Do you Do you know, Jordan? offhand no i don't and what's interesting is that's been happening all week where i think i know a word and i look up the roots and i go oh oh the roots are different like helicopter yeah. is actually helicoptera like terra being like pterodactyl flight yeah. <laughs> yeah, so okay. i don't i don't know what that means hold on let me uh, all right well perinatalon of the Aquarius. Pegasus is Perinatalon of Aquarius. What it means, and this is the, he rides a white horse, so pr presumably he's riding Pegasus, the winged horse, um, and Perinatalon means a star, two stars that are, that rise at the same time, and oh, right. so Pegasus, the winged horse, uh, in the stars, um, rises at the same time as the age of Aquarius, um, the Aquarian age. And that's uh, really interesting because the whole idea of a binary star system, I mean, you could take Jesus and Satan, you know, as brothers, a binary star system, right. as it were, and the enantiodromia of not two same stars, you know, the two dignity and difference orbiting around each other stars. Right. So the ancients 
were pretty smart. I mean, I, I don't know where they, you know, how long they were dealing with astrology in the ancient world, uh, because I think we only have human history back into what Taurus or something or, or the Ram. Yeah. Yes. But then the Persians actually were the ones who have historically done it the longest. Um, okay. And do you know when they started? And I don't off the top of my head. Okay. Let me find out. Cause I think it's, I think we are aware that it's back to prior to 3200 BC, but let me look. All right. So the significant thing about this is that in the Platonic year and the Platonic um, month, the Platonic year is actually something like 25,000 years. And a Platonic month, uh, which is something like um, Pisces, the, the constellation Pisces, take, takes about 2,100 uh, years. Uh, Shano, you were going to say something? Okay. Okay, I'm just um, I'm just pulling this stuff out of very vague mem memory because I'm not an astrologer and I never claimed to be. But um, so Christ began the age of Pisces, but the ancients when when John had this revelation, he predicted that Satan had to have his freedom for for a little season um, after a thousand years. And so the church had a pretty strong grip on everything in the dark ages okay the, it, the church developed and everything was pretty buttoned down nobody was arguing about who god was where god is all that sort of th stuff and things were pretty well buttoned down until about the year 1000 but then people started to get a little feisty and so for example, the Europeans decided that they were going to go and uh, have the Crusades for 200 years and take over Jerusalem, which they did. So there was a European kingdom of Jerusalem, which lasted 200 years. I think it ended, if I recall correctly, um, near uh, at the end of the 14th century. Uh, but I might be wrong about that on, on exact dates. Do you remember, Jordan? I don't. I just the first major major Muslim work of astronomy was Zilzar Ziz, Zij al Sandin by a Persian mathematician um, in in eight thirty. So if you're thinking first first Muslim work of astronomy in eight thirty it's not just starting out of nowhere complete there. It's been worked on for probably a thousand years. Oh, so more than that. Way more than that. So let's call it 25 to 3000, if not 3200 BC. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll look for well, I, Yeah. It doesn't really matter that much, but if we look at Chinese astrology and the, you know, the year of the Ram and the year of the snake and the year of the, water tiger is what I think we're in right now. Um, that was developing just by word of mouth in society, in the collective unconscious of the Chinese for thousands of years before it started to become, uh, yeah. before it started to become uh, memorialized and put down. But if you go into a Chinese restaurant today and you get a, a, a placemat that has the Chinese zodiac on it, uh, you will find that the description of people for your birth year are is pretty accurate to you. Um, and 
you know, I don't know if you've had this experience, but I definitely have. I was born in a dog year and dogs are very loyal. And I tend to be very loyal to my friends. And, um, and so I have uh, two girl friends, woman friends that I have known uh, for 60 years. Okay. And we communicate daily on um on text messaging uh even today and i haven't uh, well they came here and visited a couple of years back and um but i don't see them that often i see them every so often i went and visited one in california briefly uh last year um but you know we haven't been really been together for extended periods of time since 1964 in one case and since 1962 in the other case um and uh so anyway um you know actually it's interesting you say that because i always say that um like western astrology as you see a horoscope in a newspaper is is utter bs um it's beyond general. You need to know a moon sign. But with um, Chinese astrology, if I go to any restaurant, pick up that red placemat, um, it dead on. I it'll, mean, it'll nail you, right? It nails yeah, you. Yeah, because I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a goat. And take a, you know, just look at how I, I hop, you know, heights all over the place with absolutely zero footing, completely stable. So there's a, a piece that's that's my like your loyalty with the dog i mean and those are two just single qualities but they dial in so beautifully generally and you know me you know as you say speaking from the arrows that's my goat just going oh look there's a it's a, like a dime edge oh i'm fully supported you know <laughs> as if and everyone else is like yeah. Isn't that really like risk well when you when you said that i had to uh, i had to giggle yeah uh because uh because of your beard i'm sorry well no no that's true and the mountain goat piece so yeah yeah uh so I, we've had a a couple of other people join oh, okay. the panel but they're not coming onto the panel except maybe by voice so i've allowed everybody to talk you can talk you if you talk it'll be on the youtube uh, it's a nice crane recording in the picture yeah i like that jyoti um okay i'll be uh, right pardon i'll give it right back my copy just i heard the the uh i'm ready for you <laughs> my, right my okay so we've been, we've been talking about um crucial rain uh, for a thousand years and then uh satan has to be let out for a period of time so this is um, Revelation 23, I believe. Um, and, um, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed for a little season. Okay, so that started around the year 1000. By the time of the Renaissance, uh, you know, the devil got in the details and lots of things happened. Uh, you know, there was the Protestant Reformation and all kinds of things going on. Um, and then the French Revolution, the American Revolution, uh, and then we get the 20th century, which was bloody awful and so now we're entering the age the aquarian age um when aquarius is the ruling sign astrological sign and so the ancients predicted that we would we as human beings would have to rise to a new level of consciousness in other words instead of bouncing back and forth between christ and satan um we we are going to reach a new age of consciousness 
where we can find a way to reconcile with everyone uh, in the world. And so the bouncing around came because all of a sudden, um, you know, we sort of ran out of room on the earth. You know, it was all well and good when there were only 2,000 uh, human beings in the Levant uh, about 200,000 years ago, I guess, is what they estimate. Um, but gradually, human beings spread out across the planet. And, you know, there were was a little warfare and internecine fighting, but not that much. I mean, that's um, a time when when it was an agrarian society and there was plenty of room for everyone so nobody had to get too fussed about it but as time went on and starting around the you know around the time of the first history we've written um people started to bump into one another <laughs> and by the time it Christ, there were already a hundred million uh, human beings on the planet, mm -hmm. a and obviously, you know the the pyramids in Giza were built. I, I think about between three and five thousand years BC. Okay, and so that that's one theory. I won't I won't play the archaeology game, but there's a better theory that they're more like twelve to fifteen thousand. Okay, and well, what, whatever, it, whatever it, it is, it, yeah, it, whatever it is, um, obviously there had to be lots of human development before that could be even done. Right, um, the word primitive in history is really often misused because they that was a developed society. That, absolutely. That then fell. It's just like Rome fell from right. lead pipes. I mean, right. So. Right. Exactly. And so, um, you know, human consciousness was around for a long, long while. But, you know, it was like Moses says, let my people go. OK, I want to go to the yeah. promised land, the, the land where we can have space and the Egyptians can do their thing, you know, and we can have our place. And right. and so. And Moses never got to the promised land. He saw it, but he didn't ever get to it, uh, mainly because he took this little detour in Sinai for 40 years. <laughs> well, right, right. They, he, he wouldn't listen to the GPS or ask for directions. <laughs> right. <laughs> and he didn't know that his promised land was like a, a day's walk away, but you have to be able to carry enough water for that. And, right. and so probably looked like a pretty big barrier at that time and well, that's an interesting concept too there in the desert it's the same concept as a as a plateau um you have almost endless horizon on all sides all 360 degrees mm -hmm. of your compass, and you have absolutely no reason or call geographically from any landmark to lead you in any given direction. So in a sense, you have a compass without a north arrow. Right. And, and the thing is, you become the north arrow. And it doesn't matter if it's 60 feet over there. If there's a false summit between you and that, you just don't see it. So yeah. there's a piece there where uh, the whole metaphor of self-development in that 40 years is... Um, is starting to be a preamble to a new culture in a way of yeah. we're, we're making a big space, a synapse or an interstice between what was before and what will be next, that on that desert that's completely directionless, you, know, you have to yourself become the North Arrow. You have to decide and point your own way. And mm -hmm. so that's, you know, either by stars or knowing, or if you're a right. Viking, you probably just pull out a piece of iolite and you could navigate all day long. And right. So, so the important aspect of this is that the ancients figured it out uh, intuitively that it was going to take a thousand years for things to change. Mm -hmm. And that once Christ started to be accepted in, in the ancient world, um, 
you know, Christianity took over. And so there were lots of people, um, you know, the Bible wasn't even agreed to until the 325 AD. So, um, right. so that means it was all word of mouth up till then. And, you know, what do you remember from three to 325 years ago? You know, what do you, you, know, you have to ask yourself. And um, that was the Council of Nicaea, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so then these men, these patriarchal men got together and decided what the books of the Bible would be. And, and they accepted revelation. Um, except, yeah, they accepted revelation. All right. So people were having dreams and visions, and these were very numinous to them over all this time, uh, starting with Abraham, Ibrahim, um, as the father of the three Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Mm -hmm. um, and so the Bible really contains, among other things, lots of dreams and visions. And so right. uh, what Dr. Jung was doing, and this is a Jungian psychology course here, uh, what Dr. Jung was doing was doing a psychiatric, psychological interpretation of what was written there. Um, and, mm -hmm. and now we're learning that we have to do that with all art to understand where where the psyche was during these times and now the really daunting task is historians need to be also expert in psychology and go back to all the history that has been written and try to analyze what was going on psychologically in those societies as um and that whole project is only barely just beginning. I mean, I can point to it, but I'm uh, a little bit in my dotage, so I don't think I'm going to write a history book that covers that. But somebody has to do it. And mm -hmm. not only somebody, but thousands of historians have to start writing those things. Um, and, well, they have, been... and they have Go been. Ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, what's interesting, too, is that it, just in the first portion of paragraph 725, um, is Christ to key verb leading the hosts of angels treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. OK, there we're we're hanging out in biblical land. Yeah. But here's where to me it gets really astrological and, and fun. Well, we're, we, we're hanging out in imaginary land. This is the imaginal world that we're right, talking but, about. But in biblical right. land, when you actually, when they're right. specifically re referencing Almighty God. In the sure, imaginal. sure. Absolutely. So they're still in the imaginal portion of the Bible. But then you get these astrological references, which to me are, are just not masked at all. They're, they're very poetically, almost masterful kind of the obvious. And right. His robe is dipped in blood. So there's a blood moon. Because, and I say that, card before the horse, he rides a white horse. Now, it says here again, astrological speculations concerning the second half of Christian Ion may be implied with Pegasus as Paranatelon, or Paranatelon of Aquarius. As you said, that's the twin stars or two stars emerging. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, though, is if I apply the twin stars concept to he rides a white horse, mythologically, a white horse is a lunar horse. Mm -hmm. And the thing about the lunar white horse is that the moon has no light of its own. So there's either a day sky moon that you see or do you see the moon at night reflecting light from the unseen source and key key concept unseen source of the sun whereas the the moon itself is actually dark it's a dark body and so on, only on the new moon my joke is only on the new moon does the moon tell the truth mm. and that but then you can't see it so there's the see the unseen part so the lunar horse to me is it's intensely important there with 
just that paraton the um paranatelon because there's a dual nature to the horse and that's i think what's happening here is with christ and with satan and with the white horse or lunar horse paranatelon the twin stars rising um okay we're commenting on answer to job by cg young we're we're commenting on paragraph 725 there are only 758 uh, or the numbers only go to 758 in this book. They begin with 553 because the numbers relate to paragraphs in volume 11 of the collected works of C.G. Young. Um, so we only have a, a, just over 30 paragraphs to go. Uh, it's uh, It gets... Here, we're starting to get into the rock'em sock'em part of the answer to Job. Yeah, and I think with my, I mean, long-winded, saying kind of Jungian idea of a paragraph, the synopsis of that paragraph would be: We've talked about enantiodromia. Mm -hmm. We've talked about the conjunction and the mysteries of the conjunction and the uh, conjunctio oppositorum conceptually up to now, mm -hmm. with minor inferences here and there of kind of a both and. Now Jung is getting very specific with just like you said, rock'em sock'em, you know, the almighty God, the lunar horse, you know, or, you know, and that kind of thing. And, or as he says, the white horse, but I mean, I would, the almighty God, the lunar horse in just two successive sentences. So we're going. Right. From, and, and he's saying that we're going into the Aquarian age, um, right. which, right. which is what we're doing. And so the, in the last sentence, of this paragraph it says and the whole first creation disappears and what he's referring to there is that the positive of the first millennium and the negatives because satan gets out in the second millennium are going to start to cancel one another out okay the red book is full of blood it's all blood Okay, and in the 20th century, in the early 21st century, we've had around 300 million killings by war. Okay, 300 awesome. million. Um, and, uh, and now the point I was getting to about the development of humanity is now we've been bumping up against one another for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And the blood of all those sacrifices now has to go to make us more conscious. And when it does, the fifth stage of consciousness, and when it does, there'll be this sudden aha moment. And the aha moment is the one that Carl Sagan had about 50 years ago, which is, um, you know, we all live on this pale blue dot out there in an infinite universe, and uh, we better figure out a way for our species to survive on that pale blue dot. Mm -hmm. And, and I say what's interesting about the Aquarian from the Piscean or Aquarius successive to Pisces is in a sense, there's that evolutionary fish growing legs, tadpole growing legs, becoming frog crawling out of the ocean. Yeah. And, and what happens is once you crawl out of the ocean, you know, below the ocean, pretty much ceases to appear it disappears because you're now on land so there's a whole new the the whole of the first creation disappears well actually i think disappears is kind of a tricky word there and it's more that it submerges so disappear meaning simply out of sight no longer in the appearance so i think that's an interesting concept going from water and pisces oceanic to water bearer which is both except you're up here conscious with vessels you don't see whales carrying around pots and pans you know right. kind of right so the so the issue that we now see playing out in current affairs including up until about a year ago the gop didn't want to admit that there's climate change now right. uh, now the the dike is broken and the Weather Channel talks about climate change every day. Um, Senator Kelly was on uh, 
on television this morning talking about the drought in the West and in Arizona and how much water he can have out of Lake Mead. And so what we now are seeing and becoming conscious of is, oh, by the way, we have no choice. We have to raise ourselves to this fifth stage of consciousness, which will allow you know, as many human beings as possible to survive. Um, and, and, you know, if, and if we don't, it's going to be hell on earth. Go ahead, Jordan. Well, what's interesting is it's like, it's like using Baja for Egyptology. It's like, oh God, you, you just, this is a lot of in the ivory tower stuff for translation where the Egyptology, a lot of it is a narrative like a narrative biography it's not true history it's you know what we would think it would be which then there's a lot of preconceptions that didn't exist then we're learning so much now with glaciers receding yeah for example that um when as the glaciers were receding there were um some projects i think in the 50s that were at that point classified now not classified where building in, you know, a nuclear launch base under Greenland. And they realized that there was the longest valley on the world under the ice in Greenland. And that's how all of the water was being released into the ocean. Mm -hmm. But they did the core samples, you know, as they would before they start, you know, building any kind of facility. So soils engineering and all that kind of stuff. Well, they test for soils and such, but you know, then they put the core samples into a freezer and they're lost for four and a half decades. Mm -hmm. Well, someone's recently tested them and they're finding horse DNA and mammoth DNA 5,000, three to 5,000 years into the ice age, rather than the extinction event that was written about at the ice age, because that was just assuming, oh, nothing could survive. Well, that was a really not based on facts assumption. It was just mm -hmm. a conjecture, except so now with these DNA pieces, we're starting to learn that these numbers push and pull. So I think, you know, you were, we're right as earlier. Let's talk concept, not, you know, we can talk history and concept, but we don't need to know the exact date all the time. Right. It's, well, and, and, you know, glaciers have been receding for thousands, 10,000 years or more because that's what the the finger lakes are in northern new york they were all formed by glaciers yeah and, and greenland has lost its ice and had right. it come back over you know hundreds right. of thousands of years and in my my home area of upstate new york um you know you can find uh fossils of shells uh, at 1,100 feet, 1,200 feet above sea level. Uh, so, but we want to go back to answer to Job. So um, go ahead with paragraph 726. The hydrostamos, the marriage of the lamb with his bride, which has been announced earlier, can now take place. The bride is the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Her radiance was like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. The city was built foursquare and was a pure gold, clear as glass, and so were its streets. The Lord God himself and the, the Lamb are its temple and a source of never-ending light. There is no night in the city, and nothing unclean can enter into and to defile it. This repeated assurance allays a doubt in John that has never been quite silenced. From the throne of God and the Lamb flows the river of the water of life, and beside it stands the tree of life as a reminder of paradise and pyromatic pre existence. Right. It's so Let's, what I'm I'm looking what I'm looking for here is I'm looking in the black books of CG Young. Mm -hmm. th these are the raw material of the red book, and um, 
one of the one of the important things here is the fact that Jung was doing comparative study of religions long before anyone else was doing it. And and long before he was even doing them, growing up in the environment with the minister and a right, pastor. Right. He was he was swimming in it even before he knew it. Right. So I just want to read one paragraph, which is at the end of volume one of the black books. Uh, from the 1930s onward, Jung looked for a way to rediscover through historical scholarship the concepts he had independently, independently arrived at. There were two main settings in which this project unfolded. In 1933, after an interval of two decades, he returned to the university, lecturing at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. He was appointed a professor there in 1935. Between 1933 and 1941, he lectured over the course of 14 semesters, presenting a historical overview of modern psychology and above all, a comparative study of the individuation process focusing on, now this is the important phrase here, focusing on Pentangeli's Yoga Sutras, the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola, mm -hmm. Buddhist meditation, and Western alchemy. Notice Christianity is not included in this. Uh, the lectures were open to the general public. The critical insight that enabled these linkages and comparisons was Jung's realization that these practices were all based on different forms of active imagination and that they all had as their goal the transformation of the personality. He understood the latter as a process of individuation. Thus, Jung's ETH lectures provide a comparative history of active imagination, the practice he had developed in the Black Books. Um, and uh, then it goes on, the lectures went hand in hand with his regular participation in the Eranos conferences in Ascona, established in 1933 by Olga Freby Captain. The conferences ran for two weeks each year. They focused on the history of religion and culture with a particular emphasis on the relation between East and West. Jung advised Freeby Captain uh, concerning themes and speakers to invite, but was careful to avoid the conferences becoming simply a vehicle for his school of psychology. And then he, it goes on to list them. But um, what I would urge to everyone's attention is there's a book called Eranos that was written. And I, let's see. If, yes, it's, um, it's public. The author is Hans Thomas Haeckel, H-A-K-L. And it's Eranos, an alternative intellectual history of the 20th century. Um, and I have this book, and it's uh, really a terrific book and, and worth, very much worth your reading. Now, it happens that just by, um, you know, blind man's bluff, I mean, backing into it, the confluences that we've begun to do this year in Helena and next year, they, it will be in Aptos, California, are sort of a modern iteration of the Aranos conferences. Although we're not studying comparative religion per se, we're studying uh, creativity and the connection to psych psychology. But the point being, uh, that the work that Colleen Kiber has done on the creative process is parallel to all of these uh, religions. And, you know, she's written a book about it. I'm working with her to help her write a second book. She, I mean, I'm going to help her with
with editing of her second book or third maybe. Um, and, um, and so these developments are quite significant because they all re relate to this moving humanity to this next level of consciousness, to this next stage in the event, in the individuation of our species. Okay, it doesn't mean that we're not going to have uh, palpable evil in the world. I mean, we can point to Putin now, and I won't get into American current affairs, but uh, the point is there are a lot of people on a lot of stages of consciousness going back to caveman mentality, walking down the street, okay? And you just don't know how realized these people are. I mean, an adept is someone who's realized and who has reached, you know, a new level of consciousness already. And they're trying to bring the rest of us along. And, you know, that's what we're all trying to do at some stage or another here. Well, yeah, you know, in a, in a simplistic, and I do mean that word to the meaning of overgeneralized, not some high dollar word of simple, um, a simplistic example would be Cro-Magnon versus um, the um, what are the what's the why am I losing that word? Um, the two groups basically of that era of human life. There's Cro-Magnon and then the Neanderthal, mm -hmm. and the Neanderthals were very confident in their connection to nature, such that they were unthreatened, such that if you showed up in their camp, they would welcome you, feed you, probably groom you, um, and willingly receive you into their village. Whereas in the Cro-Magnons, which were pretty much love of power, which means transient, probably has not ever had any power, has to prove to mama that she, you know, that they're strong, would come in and just, you know, attack and kill everything. Right. So, you know, it, to me, the adolescent roaming of the Cro-Magnons um, was different than the evolved society of the, of the Neanderthals. Yet it's in, as if, I always wondered were the Neanderthals sociologically more Cro-Magnon earlier because they didn't settle and they didn't mature and settle. Whereas the Neanderthals are still kind of on the move learning, not really, you know, those without home as it would be. And then we have those two, the love of power and power of love in this current. Right. You know, and, event. and the significance of what I was just reading to this paragraph, which is the coming of the new Jerusalem is that all of these religions make reference to a, a imaginal holy city, a shining city on a hill, as Ronald Reagan had it, um, a new Jerusalem where everything's going to be hunky-dory. And that was the dream of all of these uh, religions. Um, and, uh, and so we have it in uh, the Bhagavad Gita, for example, um, where the, the hill is Meru, um, among mountains, I am Meru, which is what Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. But the point is that, that it's the shining city on a hill, and it exists in all these religions, including the New Jerusalem, which is what Jung is pointing out, and which he pointed out for much of the rest of his career by doing these comparative studies. Okay. Let's well, and let's... also, I think, before we move on real quick, yeah. I, this paragraph to me is the most rock'em sock'em that we're going to see almost forever. Um, in regards to the architecture he's describing mm -hmm. of how this place is constructed, because it's a series of paradoxes that could only exist if you're living on the North Pole, that there is no night, or it implies that they had 
plenty of torches or they had electricity and because they would they would light up the night so there wouldn't be a night what's interesting was like a rare jewel like a jasper okay pause there jasper green red multiple colors it's opaque you can't see through it comma clear as crystal hmm what's going on there seems to imply sunrise and sunset well and but, purity purity yeah purity yeah and also sunrise sunset because when we say and was a pure or was a pure gold comma clear as glass and so were its streets that's perplexing if you don't look at it from if you don't get out of your material sense because right. Pure gold, clear as glass, would be the divine light or sunlight. So you basically you're living in the sky, or as it were, metaphorically, on a hill. And so, so were its streets. It's a carryover of looking down from the depths of above, which means this the idea that your footing is firmly rooted in heaven, looking down through the firmaments. So architecturally, it's interesting how that even in just these several sentences, there's a whole city that's built four square, as it were. But you have to look at it not as, oh, I cut these stones out. And so that pale blue dot piece starts to become the, oh, we are not always where we think we are. Right. And, and in, in what city is it possible that nothing unclean can enter to defile it? Well, only an imaginal city, okay? Because something unclean will enter the city, whether whether it be a mi microbe or a boot with well, mud on it. <laughs> or, or living in complete sunlight so yeah. that everything is burned away. Yeah. So this image that I'm currently showing, by the way, uh, was taken by... Uh, from Voyager One, and a woman astro astronomer who I don't, whose name escapes me for now, uh, happened to be on duty in the JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, when Voyager was passing Saturn. That was that was her time of duty, and she thought, "Hmm, I wonder if I turned." Voyager around now, would I see the Earth? And um, she was alone in the mission, in mission control at the time. It was the middle of the night, and she had uh, no one to ask permission from. So she turned the spacecraft around, and there she saw the pale blue dot. And you can see it's passing Saturn here because there's Saturn's rings, and uh, and and if you want to understand how small we we are, um, Voyager One is still not out of our solar system, and it's been traveling. Uh, it's the fastest vehicle ever created by humanity it's traveling at 13,000 miles or 13 miles per second and um i think it's 13 miles per second and which isn't fast enough to do much because the speed of light is 186,000 miles a second so so it's kind of you know it's kind of buggy whip compared to the speed of light but it's still the fastest vehicle ever created by man. And it, it still hasn't gotten out of our solar system at, since 1976. So that's what, nearly 40, 46 years, I guess. Mm -hmm. And her name was Candy Hansen, H-A-N-S-E-N. Yeah, okay. All right, so, uh, but you know, that, that image is the point. Okay, right. we, we, we creatures, we little creatures in this little blue dot uh, have been bumping up against each other for thousands of years. And now all of a sudden we have to realize that, oh, by the way, we're all in the same lifeboat. <laughs> and, well, and, right. And if we you don't know, pay it's... attention, we're going to be in trouble. And, you know, I just, uh, 
I point out sometimes that the uh, the Ganges River uh, provides water to about at least 300 million Indians. And the headwaters of the Ganges River have been dammed by the Chinese in 17 locations. And so if, if the Ganges were ever, uh, if the hydroelectric there was ever closed or the Ganges were to dry up, a quarter of India would ha have insufficient water and therefore insufficient food. And when people don't have enough food and water, they tend to get a little bit porky. <laughs> right. Right. A little bit, and they and they tend to start dying too. Um, right. Well, they tend to. What's interesting to, too is right. your speed of light piece interests me. I saw a piece this last week, just a, a diagram on an astronomy site that showed the relative speed of the speed of light and with a scaled example of how long does it take light to travel from the earth to the moon or the moon to the earth and at about 280 you know, some thousand miles moon being from the earth it's about 1.3 seconds and what's interesting is you know you see star wars and warp drive and you know all the stars go by mm -hmm. well that's really a beautiful cinematic exaggeration because if I put the earth here and the moon here, it's like 1,001, 1,001, 1,000. That's about how fast you can actually see just a very fast travel between the earth and the moon. But that's it's still, you know, speedy. I'm not going to take that away. But mm -hmm. you're not going to see stars passing by because you're not going galaxy to galaxy. So yeah the warp the warp for example is a whole another thing of transcending that time piece that's to go a, that's the idea but there right. is a place we can transcend it and that's in the imagination right. right and that's that's why those movies work because we can all imagine a speed that's faster than the speed of light but in the physical world we can't do it. <laughs> right? Well, you know, that's interesting you say that because then on the yin yang symbol, I look at the dots as wormholes, but also as the capital S self in the hole. I can go so far into the light as to get to the dark. Boom, I'll go over to the other side. Then I'll go so far into the dark as to get to me and the light, the consciousness back to the dark. So it's interesting to me that you say that where, because that dot, is that imaginal infinity that's the infinity within the outer universe, which is infinite externally. Right. So they both function together. Right. They, they definitely do. And so, and, you know, what Dr. Jung was talking about often was the, um, the divine drama. The divine drama uh, is happening in the psyche. It's not mm -hmm. happening out on the earth. A lot of things that are happening on the earth aren't very divine, but in, <laughs> right. But gradually, humanity is gaining more and more consciousness. You know, I had to, I had to <laughs> caution my grandsons the other day who are entering college this week, and um, I said, "Well, you you may think that you're conscious now because mm -hmm. you." are in touch with all your senses, but every course that you take is gonna to add to your consciousness mm -hmm. and make you awake and make you understand the way we as human beings are on the planet. And, and the, you know, that interplay of all the human beings on the planet is the collective unconscious on the grandest scale. And it's that crashing together, um, which is going to raise consciousness to the fifth stage. Okay, I'll, I'll read uh, paragraph 727. This final vision, which is generally interpreted as referring to the relationship of Christ to his church, has the meaning of a uniting symbol and is therefore a representation of perfection and wholeness. 
hence the quaternity, which is, expresses itself in the city as a quadrangle, in paradise as the four rivers, in Christ as the four evangelists, and in God as the four living creatures, while the circle signifies the roundness of heaven and the all-embracing nature of the pneumatic deity. The square refers to the earth. Heaven is masculine, but the earth is feminine. Therefore, God has the throne in heaven, while wisdom has hers on earth. And as she says in Ecclesiasticus, quote, likewise in the beloved city, he gave me rest, and in Jerusalem was my power, unquote. She is the, quote, mother of fair love, unquote. And when John pictures Jerusalem as the bride, he is probably following Ecclesiasticus. The city is Sophia, who was with God before time began, and at the end of time will be reunited with God through the sacred marriage. As a feminine being, she coincides with the earth from which, so a church father tells us, Christ was born, and hence the quaternity of the four living creatures in whom God manifests himself in Ezekiel. In the same way that Sophia uh, signifies God's self-reflection, the four seraphim represent God's consciousness with its four functional aspects, the many perceiving eyes, which are concentrated in the four wheels point uh, in the same direction. They represent a fourfold synthesis of unconscious luminosities corresponding to the Tetra Maria of the Lapis Philosophorum, of which the description of the heavenly city rem remains us. Everything sparkles with precious gems, crystal, and glass in complete accordance with Ezekiel's vision of God. And just as the hero Skamos unites Yahweh with Sophia, Shekinah in the Kabbalah, thus restoring the original plero pleromatic state, so the parallel description of God and city points to their common nature. They are originally one, they are originally one, a single hermaphroditic being, an archetype of the greatest universality. And um, so I would refer everyone to Proverbs 8 in, in the Bible and uh, remind everyone of uh, Sophia pouring wisdom down to adolescent human beings, uh, which is the, the image that we created in um, this summer. Uh, I'm gonna pull it up here uh, for our confluence and which is, um, it actually represents this. Okay, so it's, here it is. All right, so here, uh, Sophia, which is wisdom, as referred to in Proverbs 8, is pouring wisdom and the water of life down to, um, down to adolescent humanity so that we can grow up and enter into this new stage of consciousness. Okay, I'll shut up. No, 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 that's, that's important. And I think another piece um, that's important there is the noting here of while wisdom has hers thrown on the earth. And what's interesting there that then Satan cast down as caretaker of the earth, so to speak, is here's another place where the church has kind of cherry picked. Oh, well, she has her throne on the earth, but then quickly we'll say, oh, yeah, that's where Satan went, you know, and so her throne is with the devil so they can demonize self-knowledge. But the problem then by default, they also demonize the very ground we all stand on, 
which then contributes further support to original sin, which is a, you know, a load of BS. And um, it's interesting here that therefore God is, has a throne in heaven, um, but he's the four animals. So they're not on earth. And then wisdom has hers on the earth. Well, that were they're supposed to be animals, but then they're not because she's conscious and animals in that sense are unconscious. So that's another way. I think it's, it's interesting here. The braids and the twists would throw off anyone who didn't have at least some early level of critical thinking skills to dance along and not get thrown off the horse and go, Oh, I have no idea what that means. I'm going to go back to the fields. Right. So I want to refer back now in the Old Testament to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, um, verses 16 to 18. I communed with my own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my heart to no wisdom and to no madness and folly. I, received, I perceived this also as vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increases sorrow. So Tim Holmes brought that passage to my attention. And it's a it's a very important passage. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll I'll put it in the uh, YouTube chat, I think, so that everybody can find it. I think uh, it's important to note, especially. I love that that particular passage because the corresponding increase in grief um, does not necessarily equate to a corresponding increase in discomfort and sadness there's a wisdom to learn how to navigate nature that occurs in that expanding knowledge so instead of just those two pieces scaling up there starts to be an interdependency between them as they do so their hearts of the matter don't get too far away from each other right um okay so this is the this is what we have to start to understand that as we gain more knowledge whether whether it be from university or from reading or from going to movies what have you um we are going to experience more grief because we have to recognize the pain and the sacrifice and the suffering that got us where we are. I mean, I just saw a movie the other night called uh, Female Spies or Women Spies, uh, one of the two. It's, uh, it's a French movie, but it's very well done. And it depicts um, the week before D-Day when, mm -hmm. um, when five women spies had to prevent a certain piece of information uh, from getting to Hitler, to Berlin. And what they go through and what it costs them is absolutely huge. It's a very archetypal movie. I highly recommend it. Um, the leading woman in the movie won the Légion d'honneur and the uh, Croix de Guerre from the F French Republic. And actually, mm -hmm. she didn't uh, she didn't die until 2004. She lived to be 98. Yeah, they had an interview with her. Yeah. So anyway, um, I urge everyone to take a look at that movie. Uh, I never heard of this little episode of World War II, but now that I know it, I um, also grieve and have sorrow uh, for the sacrifice that they made so that all of us could somehow find our way uh, into more consciousness of what we 
suffered in the Second World War. And well, and that brings up a great point about, you know, how we develop. We're always standing on the shoulders of others. Previous, absolutely. post, I mean, the post of, you know, what we aspire to, the previous of who has supported us or simply, you know, unfortunately, I'll say this way, who we stepped on, you know, be it accidentally or on purpose. Um, but what's interesting about that to me is whenever you see something of a refined development, it's important to see the unseen because the pre, the many preambles and, and many being M-I-N-I small and M-A-N-Y many, there's so many different little lead up stories and lead up actions to anything that's actually fully developed. Um, and I think you'd get a more robust sense, not just of history, but of how to navigate even say in a factual structure. Um, even here where Jung says, you know, Yahweh was Sophia. And then in parentheses, Shekinah in the, in the Kabbalah, well, Shekinah was the original female Godhead that was not just coexistent. It was just the other half of God. But then when we get Sophia and we don't have any mention of, of, of Shekinah, and then throughout history, people separate wisdom from the earth or from heaven. And what's interesting then is you, you get a disconnected presentation if you don't know the history of the word Sophia, you know, mm -hmm. back beyond Shokma, you know, to Shekinah originally. So I think back to the, the five women there, mm -hmm. they're one of the critical arteries, literally of a preamble leading up to the success of what happened on the day. Right, exactly. Okay, uh, you wanna do 728? Sure. No doubt this meant, no doubt this is meant as a final solution of the terrible conflict of existence. The solution, however, as here presented, does not consist in the rec reconciliation of the opposites, but in their final severance, by which means those whose destiny it is to be saved can save themselves by identifying with the bright pneumatic side of God. An indispensable condition for this seems to be the denial of propagation and of sexual life altogether. Ouch. Yeah, ouch. <laughs> so, yeah, that, yeah, the holier than thou, meaning I don't need to have life affirming actions anywhere i mean that's that's yeah, yeah. so the, this is the monk and the nun uh who uh give up their physical life theoretically um in order to be have a, a spiritual life exclusively and yet um we see how that definitely gets um, corrupted over the years, uh, not the least of which is what came out with Spotlight. <laughs> I'll just leave mm -hmm. it at that, the movie Spotlight. But Well, even the name of the rose was Sean Connery and Christian Slater, um, where you get, you know, a monk who has put poison on, on one corner of one page of one book that turns your tongue black when you die. There's a whole you know, Sherlock's Holmes, Sherlock Holmes and um, things that, you know, Sean Connery and Christian Slater go through to solve the mystery. But what's interesting is there's that evil, that, that meanness of one, someone hiding secret knowledge, but two, that then is kind of implied to come from this singularity of, of living only there without these things and now i i don't want to demonize them in the monastery either because yeah, yeah. that's only taking you know i, I like five to ten percent of any group are a-holes so to yeah. speak and so even there well people <laughs> are people so you're going to still get some really bad ones but but they can get more intense because they're all alone and able to focus more disciplined um, focus more in a disciplined way and so it their actions good or bad um can become more intense but anyway back to the um uh, to this um right that, okay 
So that completes um, part 14 of Answer to Job. We are now going to part 15. We're still talking about the book of Revelation. Uh, we are at paragraph 729, which means we have exactly 30 paragraphs to go uh, to complete um, complete uh, answer to Job. Uh, uh, and I think that that may take us until about Christmas. If I, well, if I, you know, there you go. I, I think it's important in this last paragraph too, to to... Um, by which means whose destiny is set to be saved and save themselves by identifying with the bright pneumatic side of God. So what's interesting here is I find there's another trickster going on because mm -hmm. the final severance to me is simply going back to realize that there are only two instead of, I have all these pieces that have differentiated back to, okay, the left side is female, sacred, female, sacred, feminine, the right side, sacred, masculine, Except then at that point with the two, I'm not girl, boy, girl, boy, right, left, right, left with my stepping. It's one dance of capital S self of me and then identifying not with the genders to me, but simply with how they operate, mm -hmm. the create, which to me, how the they fit, interact in your psyche. Right. Which, and so to me, the anima and the animus can just go away from a gender concept. And I substitute them with creative drive. And then the male side, I dispense with that and it becomes sexual drive. But the thing is, then both together, I'm no longer gendered and I'm no longer hermaphroditic. I'm then the developed person structurally. Or hopefully the, the conjunctio, which is... Yeah. We can, we can stand like the Colossus of Rhodes with one foot on each side of the harbor. And exactly. And that, that's the perfect example because this whose destiny is to be saved. Well, I can stop right there and go, oh, you're about to try to introduce another civil war, mm -hmm. meaning this development will never stop. Doesn't mean to pick a side, but it does mean you have the predominant sides and that the less dominant side or the weaker side might be the driver if you're not careful. Hence Jung's, you know, thing, unconscious things become your fate, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Which is what he says in uh, 746. But let, let's, yeah. but here we're going to talk about 729. Right. So we'll stop, stop the spoilers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> The book of Revelation is, on the one hand, so personal, on the other, so archetypal and collective, that one is obliged to consider both aspects. Our modern interest would certainly turn first to the person of John. As I have said before, it is possible that John, the author of the, the epistle, is identical with the apocalypse. Oh, apocalyptist. The psychological findings speak in favor of such an assumption. The revelation was experienced by an early Christian who, as a leading light of the community, presumably had to live an exemplary life and demonstrate to his flock the Christian virtues of truth, faith, true faith, humility, patience, devotion, selfless love, and denial of all worldly desires. In the long run, this can become too much, even for the most righteous. Irrit irritability, bad moods, and outbursts of effect are the classic simple symptoms of chronic virtuousness. In regard to the, his Christian attitude, his own words probably give us the best picture. Quote, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and he who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the expi expiation uh, for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, 
we also ought to love one another. So we know and believe that love God was for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. And he who tears, he who fears is not perfected in love. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him that he who loves God should love his brother also. And the commandment comes in John 4, 7 through 21. Mm-hmm. And I, it's interesting to me, it's, it, this, this verse has always been kind of like a pop song to me. I mean, it's like you have these little soundbite God, soundbite God, soundbite God, soundbite God. I mean, it's so it, I hate to, you know, I'm not trying to demean it at all, but there's the whole thing where, wow, there sure is a lot of talk of one person here. You know, there's all of us, look, all of us, look. And what's interesting there to me is this goes through various ways to try to, in a sense, um, legally, almost like biblical torts, you know, make it back to if you don't do this then this occurs or if you do this then that occurs and i think it's important here because in a sense it's giving a a simple roadmap of of back and forth back and forth but the one answer is always to come back to unity wholeness except even by by any divide it comes back to all right and so um The issue for Dr. Jung was that the church said that God is only good. And Dr. Right. Dr. Jung pointed out that you know God has uh, a few mu- a few other attributes. Uh, and well, yeah, it, and and we're talking about the duality between power, the power devil, so-called the power devil, and love. And the power devil always loses, ultimately. This is what Gandhi said. There have been tyrants, and for a long time, they may seem very strong. But in the end, they always fall. Think of it always. And otherwise... Well, they're they're a hard-boiled egg, and they're yellow inside. right. Right. And so the point is, we... Nobody who's within the sound of my voice, we would not exist if the power devil could win uh, in the end. Okay, because um, because we would have destroyed ourselves. We would have, um, you know, we wouldn't have gotten past clubs. <laughs> right? Well, yeah. I, you're right. And I, I think that it's the part of here that jumps out at me most is to live an exemplary life to his flock, the Christian virtues of true faith, humility, patience, devotion, selfless love, and denial of all worldly desires. If I pause right there and say, this is setting up an unseen trickster, the shepherd protects the sheep from the wolves. Except the reality is when I bring back human nature, the worldly desires, the shepherd is the one who eats the sheep. And so that brings that back. So in a sense, you pause in time. But if I leave off the denial of all worldly desires so that we don't even bring that into the equation, all these other faith, humility, patience, devotion, selfless love, Look at the nice, bright, you know, white robe shepherd with the shepherd's hook and the dog that goes out to help round up. And he's protecting the flock, except he's about to harvest them. You know, so there's 
there's a piece back and forth and there's the kind of mini revelations as it were um, of, of the ascension or the who's here kind of kind of thing that it's it, I think it's always important here from especially in this answer to Job um, to see what's not mentioned as much as what is because every time we navigate into this makes a lot of sense and we just have one aim the concept is always that there are both still mm -hmm. present even one unseen yeah okay uh you want to read on with uh 730, 730. yeah but who hates the Nicol nicolaitans who thirsts for vengeance and even wants to know wants to throw that woman jezebel on a sick bed and strike her children dead who cannot have enough of bloodthirsty fantasies? Let us be psychologically correct, however. It is not the conscious mind of John that thinks up these fantasies. They come, they come to him in violent revelation. They fall upon him involuntarily with an unexpected vehemence and with an intensity which, as said, far transcends anything we could expect as com compensation of a somewhat one-sided attitude of consciousness. Quite right. And um, this, I had a similar experience when um, I was possessed for eight months by my anima and uh, the revelation that she presented to me um, and what you can now read if you want to uh, is uh, is not an all good world, uh, but anyway, it's the story of a Japanese farm girl from age fifteen until age seventy five as the retired first woman prime minister of Japan, and um, and what her life is like. Now that to me was a revelation. Now I wrote that history down. I, I was, I had no choice. I had to write it down. And it, uh, the heroine, uh, whose name is Meiko, Meiko literally woke me up every day. I had a vision of her every morning at 6 a.m. waking me up and telling me I had to get get to the computer and write the next um, stage and then I would go into the room turn on my um, my monitor at the lowest possible light level I could just mm -hmm. so I could barely make out the the words and I put my hands on the keyboard and I have no recollection whatsoever of writing this book um, and uh, it was written, it is, uh, and, you know, just so you know, in that revelation where there's good and bad, uh, it is, it becomes uh, putting it in the, in the genteel way. It could, has several very erotic parts. Um, some would say pornography. Uh, and so do not enter if you are under the age of 18 and if you are not duly warned. But I will put in the chat um, the name of the book and the pen name under which I wrote it. Um, for... I think it's interesting. I'd like to bring up to um, a, just one passage from James Hillman's a terrible love of war book and it's to me the importance of the passage is to to not be fooled by the flow of your society now you don't have to go against the flow but there's a whole concept of only dead fish go with the flow fish are always turned upstream so the food comes right to them and it also powers and strengthens their muscles now they do swim around, et cetera, but the simple metaphor of de only dead fish go with the flow isn't 100% true, but 
it's to see the culture you live in and to speak up as it were when you get an overriding rule and this i think passage from a terrible love of war by james hillman mm -hmm. is i think speaks to this so beautifully directly in regards to the east and the west um, and it's from excursion a war of words is which is a a dropout that he put in aesthetics is so absent from american considerations that the western engagement with islam is misread in the light of american america's own religious and political devotions in quotes you can read through reams of expert writing on the modern near east writes edward said in his landmark work orientalism and never encounter a single reference to literature. Supposedly, the West is again on the ramparts, defending Christian values, as at Poitiers, Tours, France, Lepanto, and Vienna in Italy, against an enemy that has made no progress for a thousand years because it is said to be stuck in narrow scholasticism and feudal tribalism without benefit of self-division, reformation, and tolerance. We scour the, the Quran for proof of jihad instead of grasping that the essence of the Quran is its language, much as the essence of the King James Bible is its language, not the truth of its word so much as the majesty of its song. Yeah. And people who I happen to have a lot of experience with Islam and Muslims and people who are rabid Islamophobes don't know anything about it, is what I would say. Um, OK, so would you read 731, please? Sure. And also those radical Islamophobes often show in what they accuse how little they know of their own i mean it's like you know yeah their own they're, culture right they're, they're cherry picking sound bites that actually aren't even full verses they just pull yeah. out three words that support something minus yeah. the verb change the verb and they have a whole new thing so um paragraph 731 i've seen I have seen many compensating dreams of believing Christians who deceive themselves about their real psychic constitution and imagine that they were in a different condition from what they were in reality. But I have seen nothing that even remotely resembles the brutal impact with which the opposites collide in John's visions, except in the case of severe psychosis. However, John gives us no grounds for such a diagnosis. His apocalyptic visions are not confused enough. They're too consistent, not subjective and scurrilous enough. Considering the nature of their subject, the accompanying, accompanying, effect, accompanying affects are adequate. Their author need not necessarily be an unbalanced psychopath. It is sufficient that he is a passionately religious person with an otherwise well-ordered psyche, but he must have an intensive relationship to God, which lays him open to an invasion far transcending anything personal. The really religious person in whom the capacity for an unusual extension of consciousness is inborn must be prepared for such, but for such dangers, a.k.a. Right artist right so um this is uh it's important to keep repeating uh young's verse from the bible which is in first john 4 1 uh consider the spirits whether they be of god or not okay right. so so um and so when that novel po popped out of me um i put it in a drawer for 21 years i didn't write another novel because uh, i didn't want more things to pop out of me like that 
and I didn't understand where it had come from. Now I know, but mm-hmm. you know, when it first happened to me 28 years ago, um, or 29 years ago now, it uh, you know was quite surprising and shocking. And um, I thought women would not like this novel, but in fact, uh, every woman that's ever said anything to me about it loved it. <laughs> so what can I say? Well, and I think what's interesting, especially as a male, um, we're brought up to have fit, finish, and polish. We're brought up to have success. We're brought up to accomplish. All these things are things that occur after the equal sign. And before the equal sign, is always a process. And to me, what's interesting is we are always taught the product, but we're rarely taught the process. And I think what's interesting about that to me is that you get a lot of people who, you know, latch on to quote unquote materialism. I don't think they're latching on to materialism. I think all they have been shown are the, you know, man with the Midas soul, Midas touch starves the soul. Mm-hmm. They only see the gold. They don't see this big, three ton pile of dirt and rock called ore that they have to literally ore that they have to row through and then even with acids you know pan out and to create this beautiful thing at the other end and then make a sculpture with it or a jewel piece of jewelry so i think what's interesting here like when you you put that away and the you know most women are like well oh okay cool I mean, there's a creative drive that had sexual drive married, and that's called story, you know, right. and and we're taught that fit, finish and polish. And also, oh, oh, little Johnny, you know, don't don't say those kinds of things. We can't talk about that. Well, right. And, not and that the, we can't. It's that they're trying to teach discernment and discretion to you don't have to tell that to everyone. You know, right. my wife is a very wise woman. Um refused to read my book as I was writing it. I mean, I was talking about certain aspects of it, but she refused to read it while I was writing it. And that's a very wise way to treat a spouse's creativity, no matter what, because if as a spouse, you come in, come in and say, no, nah, that's nothing, or, oh, I don't like that chapter, or wh- whatever it is, then you're going to really put cold water on someone's creativity. So she didn't do that. She said, um, I won't read it until you've had 10 other women, 10 other women read it. I mm-hmm. had to have 10 other women read it before my wife would read it. And so I was like, oh, okay. But what she didn't know was, or what she knew, but didn't connect up was that I worked in an industry of women that largely had women doing all the work in various levels um, and in various roles. And so I I had lots of women around, so I just started to pass it out. (laughs) And (laughs) and, uh, I probably passed it to at least 100 women actively. uh, And... um, and so far as anyone ever said anything to me about it, they loved it. And so then I showed it to my wife, my mother, my mother-in-law, everybody got to see it and they all loved it. So. Well, and that's, I think, I think that's important. I mean, I think you're expressing too. I, I know in, in 1991 to 1994, I, I was doing watercolors and oils and the watercolors were more architectural and more mandala. And I was, I would talk about those all day long. And the oils were dark and thonic and, mm-hmm. and which was actually new for me because they weren't pretty. They were moving. Um, mm-hmm. But I, it was where I was making the distinction unknown to myself between beauty and pretty. And that pretty was pretty superficial and that yeah. beauty was, you know, to the bone. And sometimes was just simply showing the marrow. Um, but I remember I would talk all day about the watercolors, you know, and not all love and light kind of thing, but, you know, they were fine. But when people ask me about the oils, 
I would say, well, I've done my job. It's now how you're moved and you talk about it. That wasn't a truth. The truth was I was terrified to talk about the verbs and the dreams and the things of you know fire and dragons and whatever, even in people that came from the generative parts that you know tilled that soil and made those oil paintings. When in reality, I look back and I'm like, oh, those were just dreams. And they're actually when looking at it, that's kind of tame. You know, yeah. I mean, so I'm like. Where's the, where did this prudishness come from? And I remember, you know, maybe 10 years ago, just looking back and just chuckling, going, oh, um, Protestant, don't quit, work ethic, um, prove, show your work. I mean, everything's fit, finish, and polish. Everything's the gold. No one wants to go through the or. And what's interesting is this was the or, O-R-E, of me, OAR rowing through my psyche. Right. And I, I think that's important that we, we, we teach process, even if it's just a concept, instead of all this, we're number one, who won the game, you know, the end piece, the top of the mountain, well, the top of the mountain is beyond temporary. It's just, <laughs> you know, it's just a milestone in the moment. And now it's like, oh, look at the other mountain. And right. The metaphor I love actually is in Denver, if you go up to um, uh, Mount Democrat, you can actually do three 14ers in one day. Um, if, if you're quick enough, you can do Democrat and then you, I think you can do, I think it's Ford and Lincoln, but mm -hmm. you can summit three 14ers in, in, in one day, you know, and then get off the mountain by two o'clock, the storms come in. But um, even so, I'd have to say, okay, cool, but also, so what? Tell me about the trail. Tell me about the passage up and the passage down and the passage, passage across. Yeah. So I think we get lost. I think process gets lost from the equation, even especially now in political races. I mean, what, you know, it, it, the joke from the onion, Texas is going to require clear backpacks to make sure that kids don't sneak any educational materials into the schools, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, but by the way, I will be finishing Animal Farm today with its Rock'em Sock'em last chapter. Nice. <laughs> okay, I will read on. Paragraph 732. The purpose of the apocalyptic visions is not to tell John as an ordinary human being how much shadow he hides beneath his luminous nature, but to open the seer's eye to the immensity of God. For he who loves God will know God. We can say that just because John loved God and did his best to love his fellows also, this gnosis, this knowledge of God struck him. Like jo Job, he saw the fierce and terrible side of Yahweh, for this reason, he felt his gospel of love to be one-sided, and he supplemented it with the gospel of fear. God can be loved, but must be feared. Now, I concur with that entirely. I do not practice Christianity anymore, and only rarely Buddhism. But I would say that um, that when I, I wrote a book called Tsunami of Blood in my own name, so people can find it under my name, as uh, Skip Conover, I think is what the author is listed in that. It's called Tsunami of Blood. And um, my wife read that one and she said, well, I was surprised to see you mention God so often in there. Mm -hmm. And because we don't, go to church we never have gone to church on a regular basis i mean we go occasionally um for christmas and easter services uh mostly to satisfy my mother-in-law and um and i said well you know because 
God does exist and God, but God is not what they taught us over there in Sunday school. <laughs> right. And, and this was Dr. Jung's point that we all have a God image within us, which is the self, which is the director of our lives actually. And uh, our collective, the collective unconscious at many different levels also has a, is has a god image i i would say in in different collectives but ultimately the collective of human beings um is what jung would call uh is the collective unconscious which jung called god um you know it's I think so exactly and what's interesting here is I also see Carl Jung Job's attorney for now paragraph after paragraph one giving Job a rest a well needed hey bench yourself for a couple of couple of you know plays here because here we don't we hear you know mention of Job here like Job it's not Job's experience anymore and but here what I find is interesting this is as if Carl Jung, attorney on behalf of you know, defendant Job, is basically saying, hey, Job, don't feel so bad. You're not the only one I torture like this all the way to redemption. You know, it's because like, yeah. he's yeah. giving all these other examples of, you know, the, the luminous nature, but open to the seer's eye. I mean, all these back and forth things like, oh, you have you can see so brightly. Well, that I'm going to give you even more intensity. I mean, that's, I think, important right. where, again, this is really Jung playing the title, answer to Job, rather than right. besides the preamble of going through his experience. Right. And I remember uh, a comment from poet uh, David White, who's a living uh, Irish poet. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, David White said something to the effect of, uh, I know how this man learns. He gets defeated by bigger and bigger assholes. I mean, he didn't use yeah. the word. He didn't use the word asshole. But, you know, the boss is always, always an idiot, right? No matter where you go and no matter what job you have, there's always a problem with the boss. And, um, and the way we learn is to be defeated by bigger and bigger people. And that's how we advance in our careers until we uh, sort of pop out of our careers and then our careers become something else as Jordan's and mine have, where mm -hmm. we're no longer chasing the brass ring at the top of our career ladder that we originally set up, but we realize that we are actually beyond that and um and then to come back down to the mountain i mean i have a simple question i mean what am i in service to and and what happens it becomes a currency of value and people say well what about money and i don't play the oh it'll come that's a wishy-washy smoking of hope mm -hmm. it's that i have found a place where the currency of value I don't grumble in the morning. I look out the door and it's like, oh, is it good weather? Okay, I'm going to work. Or it's raining. I better write the next chapter in that next piece. You know, I, mm -hmm. so I'm always working. It just depends on, you know, how it occurs. Yeah. But I think like you have this channel, you know, for the last six or so years and the what am I in service to currency of value becomes the what's in place i'm not blaming anyone else it's not like oh hey jordan if, if you work just as hard next year i'll get another lamborghini you know it's you're not playing that blame game it's yeah. and now i don't have one but it's the kind of thing where i kind of don't really want one um, right and if you read chapter nine of animal farm um you'll see exactly uh, what the results are when the the horse boxer um, goes to his end saying, um, I will work harder and Napoleon is always right. 
And right. so I urge everyone to go take a look at my band book project uh, in the playlist. And uh, the first nine chapters of Animal Farm have been read for you there. And all those nine chapters are edited so they don't have my flubs in them anymore. And today I'm going to read chapter 10 in raw form, and that will be live at some time of my choosing nice. in the next couple of hours. I think the big, the critical thing to me in this paragraph, paragraph 732, is that, um, like Job, he saw the fierce, this is John, saw the fierce and terrible side of Yahweh. For this reason, he felt his gospel of love to be one-sided. And for this reason, he supplemented it with the gospel of fear. And what's interesting to me is we focus on that, you know, fear of God piece. There's also the, the God is love piece. But what's yeah. interesting here is John was aptly understanding that the only way to deal with the process of these intensities is don't get too um, teacher's pet about the light or the dark. Mm -hmm. Don't get too blame gamey about the you know light or the dark. You, you need to understand that if you, you teeter too high on one, you're going to fall. And if you have both, you'll have a more robust balance all the time. And right. it reminds me of, um, of the justice card in the tarot. Often decks will um, put a heart weight against a feather, which is, you know, the goddess Mahat, the, the keeper of the door to the underworld. Um, her cover charge is to weigh your heart against a feather. Now, that's not that I have a porterhouse heart. It's $28.99 a pound, and it weighs, you know, 8.6 8 pounds to this feather that's like a paperclip, one gram. Yeah. You know, you, right. everybody would lose. The metaphor is, is your heart buoyant enough to unweight the scale and fly with the feather as your other wing because the feather is then the intellect. So right. is your head and your heart, are your head and your heart married? So when, you know, John pulls in the gospel of fear to go with the gospel of love, he's basically re-completing the picture. So he went down this path of love, but then going, but wait, don't be naive. I just did this to show you the other is always still there yeah okay so and, and that and the other is always still there that's exactly the message in chapter 10 of animal farm okay. or nine as a, yeah nine as well a no word. i'm saying in chapter oh, 10 in chapter, as yeah. well okay so uh, that's what i'll be reading this afternoon so uh, jordan take us home yeah 1033 with this, the seer's range of vision extends far beyond the first half of the Christian ion. He divines that the reign of Antichrist will begin after a thousand years, a clear indication that Christ was not an unqualified victor. John anticipated the alchemists and Jacob Bohm. Maybe he even sensed his own personal implication in the divine drama since he anticipated the possibility of God's birth in man with the alchemists, Meister Eckhart, and Angelus Silesius also intuited, which the alchemist, Meister Eckhart, and Angelus Silesius also intuited. He thus outlined the program for the whole ion of Pisces with its dramatic enantiodromia and its dark end, which we will have still to experience and before whose, without exaggeration, truly apocalyptic possibilities, mankind shudders. The four sinister horsemen, the threatening tumult of trumpets, and the brimming vials of wrath are still waiting. Already the atom bomb hangs over us like the sword of Damocles. And behind that lurk the incomparably more terrible possibilities of chemical warfare which would eclipse even the horrors described in the apocalypse. Luciferi viris ascendat Aquarius acres. Aquarius sets aflame Lucifer's harsh, harsh forces. Could anyone in his right senses deny that John correctly foresaw at least some of the possible dangers 
which threaten our world in the final phase of the Christian eon. He knew also that the fire in which the devil is tormented burns in the divine pluma, pleroma forever. God has a terrible double aspect. A sea of grace is met by a seething lake of fire, and the light of love grows with a fierce dark heat of which it is said, ardent non lucet. It burns, but gives no light. That is the eternal, as distinct from the temporal gospel. One, one can love God, but must fear him. Okay. Amen to that. Um, because we all have a God within us. We all face the God of the collective unconscious. Uh, and that God has many features. In the United States, the collective unconscious has 315 million mm -hmm. human beings, human attributes, and it's the combination of those that will decide our short-term fate. I have my own prophecy about how that will come out in the next three years, but I don't need to give it at this point. Well, I, I think that's um, important in this paragraph where um, Aquarius sets aflame Lucifer, Lucifer's harsh forces. So yeah. Aquarius is the water bearer. And then um, the ardent non lucet, it burns but gives no light. That's the calcinacio. You've got this white powder. And until, but all you have to do, literally, just add water and flame comes. So you're lighting a fire with water. So there's the water bearer when you pull this all together. But the trickster again, every single paragraph has one here um, where could anyone in his right mind deny that John correctly foresaw at least some of the possible dangers, et cetera, et cetera. He knew also that the fire in which the devil is tormented burns in the divine pleroma forever. So what's happening here is the whole torment of the earth, the whole torment of the devil is just pulling that little golden spark of fire from heaven, but also then we demonize it afterwards as if this was the torture. Well, it's also, you know, if, if the angels speak, you know, you'll die as if oh, we can't understand, we can't hear deeply enough. So I think it's interesting here where the fire in which the devil is tormented burns basically in heaven forever mm -hmm. true and so so you're dealing with it you know well, why is it so bad when it why is it torturing the devil well it's torturing the devil because he's no longer in heaven you know he's no right. longer up there so out here there's the context of oh matter will be burned but spirit will not be yeah so susan mason says uh, this is for you jordan that reminds me, Jordan, I received my tarot in the land of Mysterium two days ago. Okay. Thank you for, thank you. Cool. I look forward to hearing what, how it, how it dances with you, what you, what you think of it. Yeah. Nice. Okay. We'll call that a wrap for today. Um, oh, oh. We, we're... <laughs> It kills you hours. Okay. Yeah, we're at paragraph 734, so we don't have much left. But uh, in my version, at least, there are a lot of marks. So it's going to take a while. Uh, there's an example. <laughs> well, no, and I, marks I, I, and double marks. And I, I'm, I'm with you because to me, it, it's kind of, I remember um, when the office is most cluttered, everything is about to be clean. I mean, everything is about to be finished because that's when everything's running on all cylinders. You know, the, the car on the track is running clean, but the whole mechanics, you know, the whole mechanics bay is is chaos. And right. they're, you know, there are wrenches over here and this over there, and we're not going to fix that anymore. So we even just push that aside. And um, well, so, it's, yeah. like, it, it's like Carson in uh, Downton Abbey who says, well, that Downton Abbey works like a swan. It travels on the surface um, at, the, at the upper level, 
like everything is smooth and perfect and everybody's wearing their diamonds and their perfect clothes and down below everybody's working like hell <laughs> yeah yeah exactly with those yeah. pages that's that's a perfect way to put it yeah the yeah. whole process of what you don't see behind the scenes which goes back to that whole we see the product the gold but the process of everyone working like hell below you know below the water right. um well, it's a pleasure to have these conversations with you, Jordan, regardless of whether we help others, but we've had consistently 10 or 12 people online throughout, and some have been here the whole time. So, uh, and I echo, I echo the, the pleasure as well, because it's, yeah. I think we, we're different enough that we get a different perspective but not so different that we're at each other in the ring, so to speak, you know? And yeah. so it's, I think there's, um, and I think part of it too is when anything where we have a complete difference, I really have to say, I appreciate the wonderful unthreatened qualities of dignity and difference mm -hmm. where we're not trying to impress anybody. We're yeah. going through, to, we're going through to discuss this stuff. And um, this is what we see. Yeah, and see about, you know, what you know, what see what you see, what you see. Yeah. Okay. So we cool. will wrap call that a wrap for today. Thank you. Um yep. I want to remind everyone that uh tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern time, um 10 a.m. Pacific time, 11 a.m. mountain time, uh tw 12 noon central time. Uh, we will be having a debrief with Murray Stein and Henry uh, Abramovich, who were the authors of uh, The Analyst and the Rabbi, which is the play that we performed in June. And uh, those two gentlemen are working on another play, which is called Eronos, which we haven't seen yet. It was promised for to be available about now, but I'm not sure. But anyway, the, the, this is a wisdom path event. And if you, um, if you, let's see, I, I guess I should put the, the link. Uh, if you want to get the link, you're going to have to um, go into our MailChimp and register for wisdom path at the very minimum. Uh, and that will right. uh, that will give you the link for tomorrow's session. It promises to be a very good session. And um, let's see. Because it won't be recorded and, and then archived. It'll it's live stream to well, I, well, it's going to be live streamed. Uh, right, but and, it's not going to be like such that I you know if I miss it, you can I can come in later and watch. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm intending for it to be live streamed, but hey, Miles is here. Uh, hey, Miles. So, yeah, definitely listen to that recording. Uh, Tim is going to be the master of ceremonies tomorrow, and, um, and I will be flying the Zoom. I am expecting a pretty good turnout, so I hope everyone will register and come if you go to that mailchimp and sign sign up for wisdom path mm -hmm. uh, you will receive the notice of where where the links are the coordinates for that session so please check that uh, i have been sending it out for i think for most groups including this sunday group mm -hmm. um, for a couple of weeks now so if if you've gotten an if you're already on our list and you've gotten a notice for advanced reading group or Sunday group or Monday group, um, you uh, should have the coordinates in, in that email. Um, but if you haven't done, that's when you need to get on that MailChimp and make sure you sign up at least for Wisdom Path so that you'll have the links tomorrow because I will be sending them out probably later today since this uh, event is going to be fairly early tomorrow so okay i'm glad i, really I enjoyed, remembered I really to mention that this week i really enjoyed today because we're getting into that 
the, the both and, but instead of just talking about it kind of thing, we're getting into the, this isn't just a two-stroke motorcycle. I mean, the, we've got to <laughs> get in a V10 that's starting to, you know, get the RP, RPMs going up. Yeah. Like you said, rock them, sock them. And um, it's good stuff here because I think there's a lot of applicable things where Jung kind of brings, literally brings it home. And these are things that you can use, I think, in your own process of psychological development um, that are always there and that you're kind of always complete, but you're never finished lifelong. But here it's, oh, we got the good stuff. We finally got to dinner, you know? Yeah. Yep. The good stuff is uh, coming. Uh, there, there are only uh, about 26 paragraphs left and they are full of meat. So we'll see how it goes. Um, so anyway, peace. Take care. Right. Thanks, Joji, for yeah. your comment. I appreciate it on uh, YouTube. I noticed it. And uh, oh, let's see. Did I? Yeah. Yeah. OK. I got it to everybody. So let's whoops. Wait a minute. Yeah, there's the MailChimp. OK. All right, so see you uh, tomorrow, everyone. It's going to be a big day. Both uh, the uh, wisdom path plus uh, in the evening, we'll be having our regular session on volume seven. So peace, take care. All right. And look for uh, chapter 10, the last chapter of uh, Animal Farm Leader today. <laughs>